The history of van skateboarding is crazy. We get into them going bankrupt and them being the fastest growing shoe brand, making a name in the clown industry, doing the first ever Supreme shoe collab, a rough patch they went through in the 90s, their iconic pro model shoes, and much, much more. What's up guys? My name's Levi, this is Shred Shop, connecting you to skateboarding. And today we're doing 14 things you didn't know about Vans skateboarding. In this video, we're gonna talk about how they created skateboard contracts for professional skateboarders, how they filed for bankruptcy and came back from the dead, Steve Caballero's influence on the brand, Jeff Rowley, and so much more. All right, let's get into it. The original skate shoe. Paul Van Doren got his start in the footwear industry by working at Randolph Rubber Company. You might remember this company from our video, The History of the Skate Shoe, because they were the first ones to come out with the skateboard shoe called the Randy 720. When Paul was working there, he had an idea that he wanted to sell directly to consumers, but Randolph was heavily invested in selling to stores first. Paul then decides to leave so he can start his own footwear brand with his brother, James Van Doren, and two other partners. The Van Doren Rubber Company opens its doors March 16th, 1966 in Anaheim, California. The Van Doren Rubber Company gets abbreviated to Vans. At this time, customers were coming saying, I want this shoe, but in this color or this pattern. And so any customer could go and buy a third of a yard of any fabric, bring it to them, and they would make them fully custom design of their shoes. You could also buy just a left shoe or just a right shoe, which made them very popular, especially among skateboarders in Southern California. At that time, a set of men's shoes was $4.49 and a set of women's shoes was $2.29. Next up, skater design footwear. Skaters obviously loved Vans, and Vans was the first brand to reciprocate the love to skateboarders. Skateboarders in Southern California love Vans and their waffle grip because they're flat soled and they're super sticky rubber. So they're great for skateboarding. In 1976, Stacy Peralta and Tony Alva sit down to design the very first ever skater design skate shoe. This is the shoe that we know today, the Vans era. At that time, it was called the Style 95. The very next year, they come out with the Style 38. This is the Skate High. And it was the second shoe that had great input from skateboarders. Also in 1977, they signed the world's first ever skateboarding shoe deal. They signed the world champion Stacy Peralta to Vans for a whopping $300 per month. If you put that into consideration with inflation, that's $1,362 today in 2022. Next up, Vans sports shoes. Skateboarders embraced Vans and Vans leaned into it. The thing is, these other big sporting brands had no interest in skateboarding, so they pulled out. Fast forward a bit to the 80s. Other brands are making great sports shoes and Vans decides, we are gonna do it too. Let's cash in. They start making all these wild and wacky Vans shoes. Running shoes, football cleats, roller skates, break dancing shoes, baseball cleats. They even made clown shoes for a while. They made clown shoes for 14 years. At that time, the deck shoes were $10 and the clown shoes were $60. A lot more material, I guess. In the 70s, they even made shoes for the US Air Force. They also had a point where they tried to make Vans skateboard wheels. These sports shoes caused quite a bit of tension in the company. James wanted to move in the direction of growing in the sports arena and Paul wanted to stay true to their roots by sticking with vulcanized deck shoes that people skate in. This all came to a head in 1985 when James decided to leave in an epic court battle, suing each other, all this crazy stuff. But basically James left, Paul remained. James tried to start his own footwear brand that was similar to Vans at the time called Awesome Footwear, but it only lasted two years. It's interesting to note that the side stripe on the Vans was nicknamed the Jazz Stripe. It was something that Paul drew on a piece of paper and he wanted to put on their basic shoes because they wanted them to stand out and be more recognizable. Moving on to Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Unknown actor Sean Penn requested specifically that his character, Jeff Spicoli, the lovable stoner surfer skateboarder guy, wear checkerboard slip-on Vans. Fast Times came out in 1982, and that year, van sales went from $20 million to $45 million. Oh, no! And the checkerboard slip-on shoe was the iconic Southern California shoe. No other shoe was more synonymous with SoCal. Next in their story, bankruptcy. In 1984, only two years after their crazy success with the Fast Times film, Vans files for chapter 11 bankruptcy. The company was just growing way too fast and they had way too many models of shoes that they just couldn't keep up. They were in $12 million of debt. And so they decided to hunker down and bring it back to the back to the classics. I'd like to return to the to the to the classic. 
Mm. Focus on what works and shed all the other stuff. A few years later, they would also get bought out by the venture firm McCohen DeLue Co. for $74 million. Paul and his partners would all use this money to retire. One of the greats, Steve Caballero. 1988 is a historic moment in the Vans timeline because they decide to sign the legend Steve Caballero. In 1987, Steve Cab made 250K off his Powell board royalties. Whereas in 1988, when he gets signed to Vans, his contract contract is $800 per month. This isn't because Vans was cheap. This is because skateboard shoe deals were a very, very new thing at the time. They were a novel concept. The next year, Vans approached him about doing a professional skateboard shoe, which was not something that had been done up until that point. Originally, they offered him a royalty of 75 cents per shoe, which was less than he was making on boards. And so he felt like he was being ripped off. So of course he said no first. Then he showed the contract to Lance Mountain. Lance said to him, well, you could not get Get ripped off and make no money or you can get ripped off and make a lot of money. So then in 1989, the Vans Caballero comes out. It's the second ever professional skateboard shoe to come out. By 1992, street skateboarding was exploding. People were taking the Vans Caballero and cutting the top off, making them a mid top. Then they were taking and putting stickers or duct tape all around the collar to keep all the foam in. Cab said he tried it himself. He did it a few times on his shoes and then after a while was just lazy. So he called Vans and said, can you just make a shoe that that's a mid top. For me, being a trendy person, I ended up doing that myself. So I started cutting them, and I think around the second or third pair, I was like, I was over it. I was like, why don't we just make it like that? <laughs> and that's how the Vans Half Cab was born. Probably the most iconic skateboard shoe ever. Let us know below if you ever had a pair of half cabs or if there's a more iconic shoe. You could see every big pro skateboarder wearing them at that time. People like Eric Costin, Rob Deerdeck, Solomon Aga, Stevie Williams, Javante Turner, and of course, Mike Carroll. Interesting to note, Javante Turner was the first person ever to cut down the cabs and make them half cabs. First person to cut down the cabs was Javante Turner. If Javante started it, Mike Carroll solidified it. He's probably the pro most synonymous with having the cut down half cap. He then went on to have a pro shoe with Vans that looked strikingly similar to the half cap. This would be a brief stint though before he left for the launch of DC shoes. In the early 90s, Cab loses his pro board with Powell at that time. They say he's not marketable enough. So he's just getting a paycheck from them and no royalties. Luckily at that time, the half cap is cranking. It's blowing up, everyone's wearing it. And Vans gets a new C CEO, which means that Cab gets to renegotiate his contract on the shoe and change his royalties from 75 cents a shoe to $1.25 per shoe. Just this year, we celebrated the 30 year anniversary of the half cab. You can check out our other video, 30 things you didn't know about Steve Caballero. We talk about how Thrasher named him the skater of the century, how he's featured in all the Tony Hawk Pro Skater video games, how he's credited with creating the front side board slide and how he broke the world record for the longest board slide amongst many other things, but I'll let you go watch. If you guys love this video we've got so many more check them out but also like subscribe and comment so we can keep making them if you're on other platforms follow us at shred shop and me at levi switzer moving on to the weird years except for the silver lining of the half cab the 1990s was not a great decade for vans because the popularity and the rise of super technical skate shoes was massive it was everywhere skateboard shoes were big and bulky and had airbags everywhere and they were super far from the dna of what vans was vans followed this trend and you you can see it in shoes like the Willy Santos, Solomon Naga 4, the Vans Cab 7, and the Omar Hassan Pro Shoe. Even the Simon Woodsock Pro Shoe. Skateboarding was experimenting and so was Vans. Next up, Warp Tour. In 1995, the Warp Tour was birthed and it was skateboarding and punk rock and heavy metal and music and all this culture blended into one festival. When Vans became a sponsor of Warp Tour, they brought skateboarding on board and it seemed like everything just kind of meshed together. This festival featured bands like No Doubt, Sublime, The Descendants, AFI, Limp Bizkit, The Dead Kennedys, and a lot more. At one point, Airwalk came in and tried to steal the lead sponsorship title from Vans. They did this by offering a ton more money, but the founder of Warp Tour decided they wanted to stick with Vans because Vans had stuck with them since the beginning. Vans has always had a solid relationship with the music scene and sponsoring bands. We also like to think that although the Warp Tour isn't around anymore, the spirit of it still lives on through their events called the House of Vans. Next, 
Supreme Footwear. In 1996, Vans partners with a little skateboard shop in New York that you've probably actually never heard of. I might not even say it. It's called Supreme. They do the first ever Supreme collab shoe. Way before the Nike drops, the ones that people are crazy about lining up around the block and reselling. It was an old school. It was also a cool foreshadowing to the long relationship that Vans and Supreme have had over all these years. Supreme and Vans have had lots of crossover skaters ride for them, like Rowan Zarilla, Ben K, Aiden Mackey, and Cher Strawberry, just to name a few. It's interesting to note that the company that owns Vans, VF Corp, in 2016 bought Supreme for $2 billion. So now they got the same mother. Next, a woman's pro shoe. In 1998, Vans gives Cara Beth Burnside the very first ever female pro model shoe. It's crazy that at that time, women's skateboarding was such a small community that Cara Beth had to compete in the men's category of competitions. There was no women's category. Fun fact, Cara Beth was at the Winter Olympics in 1998 for the USA snowboard team. Vance has always been on the progressive side of equality in skateboarding, and this helped pave the way for that to happen. Those times are foreshadowing to today with the Lizzie Pro Model shoe that is the first ever unisex skate shoe that has a huge ad campaign comparable to any massive pro shoe. From then in 1999, everything changes. A young chap from Liverpool, England, with only $100 in his pocket, moves to California. His name, obviously, Jeff Rowley. He explodes onto the scene, making it onto the cover of every skate mag, pushing the boundaries of what can be done on a skateboard. At that time, he's pro for flip skateboards and airwalk shoes. He comes out with a pro shoe, and when it dropped, he absolutely hated it. He said he didn't really get that much input on the shoe. In 1999, he bails on airwalk to ride for Vans for less money. He was obsessed with the waffle sole, and he started designing shoes that looked like Vans again. Coming out of the big puffy 90s phase, he helped bring them back to their roots. We believe he's a huge part in saving the brand and bringing Vans to where it is today, and he's designed over over 20 pro model shoes with them. The Vans Rolly shoe catalog on its own is a multi-million dollar shoe franchise. Steve Cab mentions that Rolly might be the only one to rival his shoe royalties at Vans. He lets out shoes like the Classic, the Rolly XLT, the XL2, the XL3, the Rolly X, the Solo, the Shambles. We can't say that naming shoes was ever a strong point. I'm just kidding. <laughs> if you look at all of the shoe designs, they definitely bring you back to the core DNA of what Vans is with the side stripe and its simplicity. With this shoe like the Rolly XLT, they almost became a brand all on its own because it had this huge following where other pros were promoting them like crazy, like Bastion Salabanzi, Terry Kennedy, Evan Hernandez, Van Wastel, and Scott Kane. Rolly joining Vans gave them legitimacy and it opened the doors to what other pros could be signed. Guys like Dustin Dolan, TNT, Bastion Salabanzi, and obviously so many more. It's actually really cool that Vans has kept their legends team alive. They have guys like Steve Cab, Tony Alva on there, Ray Barbie, Asoy, and they've just just recently added the legend Jeff Grosso. The other thing about the Rolly legacy on Vans is he always had the most insane ads and they're always shot by this guy Daniel Harold Sturt. The big bio. In 2004, Vans gets purchased by VF Corporation for $400 million, which is not a bad investment for them because by 2011, Vans was breaking $1 billion in annual sales. And by 2016, they were doing over $2.3 billion in sales and having record breaking growth for the shoe industry. It's also interesting that in 2004, the same year as the bio, they started their Vans Customs, where you could go online and design your own shoes, which kind of brought it full circle back to where they were. Now we're asking them to start selling shoes by the one, not by the pair anymore. Let us know below if you think it's a good idea. Next up, Propeller. In 2015, Vans releases their very first ever full-length film called Propeller. It features skaters like Curran Caples, Tima Ferguson, Kyle Walker, Daniel Lutheran, Gilbert Crockett, Elijah Burrow, TNT, and Andrew Allen, plus many more and there's legends mixed in throughout the video like Steve Cab, Tony Alva, and even Ave who had last part and won Skater of the Year that year. It was directed by Greg Hunt who made other films like Minefield and it was a critically acclaimed film. The big guy, the Birdman. On April 13th, 2020, Tony Hawk announces his partnership with Vans. This is pretty iconic because like Steve Cab, Tony Hawk has been wearing Vans for decades, obviously on and off, and it just seemed like a match made in heaven. If you watch the search for Animal Chin, if you look close, Everyone is wearing Jordan 1s, except for Tony Hawk, who's wearing Vans skate highs. So he's obviously had a long, strong relationship with Vans over the years. Only a few months after Tony joins, they add longtime friend of Tony Hawk and legend Andrew Reynolds to the team. Now let's take a look at the modern Vans. Today, the Vans legacy is still going strong. They're the number one shoe in skateboarding, and they have a stacked team with people like Abe, Shima Ferguson, Elijah Burrow, Gilbert Crockett, Kyle Walker, Jeff Rowley, TNT, Rowan, Curran Capel, 
Nichols, Lizzie Armanto, Rana Gearing, Dustin Henry, Justin Henry, Beatrice Damon, Tanner Van Vark, and obviously a lot more. And they're keeping true to their heritage and they still have their legends division with guys like Omar Hassan, Tony Alva, Steve Cab, Ray Barbie, Christian Hussoy, and John Cardiel, and the late Jeff Grosso. It's really important to us that Vans is still heavily invested in local skateboard shops and the local skateboard communities. A lot of other skateboard shoe companies are not interested on being involved at a local level. For us with Shreds, they help us out in ways like paying for our insurance for skateboard camps, buying drinks and pizza for the kids for Go Skateboarding Day. They donate shoes for our girls' skate club. They've also sent us to different skateboarding events from movie premieres to different shoe releases. They pay for our waffles that we feed the kids at skate camps. They also give shoes to skateboard programming that we help out with at our local Indigenous Reserve. With us being a small shop with not a ton of our own budget, Vans comes alongside and waters the seeds of our skateboard community, making it possible for skateboarding to reach out to so many. All that is bigger than the store. It's our community. It's putting skateboarding in the hands of so many people. So for that, we want to say thank you, Vans. You've helped us, you've helped our community, and you've helped skateboarding so much. All right, guys, that's it. My name's Levi. This is Shred Shop, connecting you to skateboarding. And this is 14 things you didn't know about Vans skateboarding. Stay tuned for comment of the week. Oh, we got a spicy one for you, my guys. It's from my friend, Mark Fitzzerka. He said, this crazy Canadian has me watching every video as they drop. Listen, Mark. Big kisses to you, bud. I don't even watch all these videos when they drop. Boom. If you guys like this, you're definitely gonna like one of these two videos.